Today is the 142nd anniversary of the battles of Isandwana and Rourke's Drift, fought on the 22nd of January 1879. So today's 5 Minute Friday is perfect. I'm talking about Frank Edward Bourne, OBE DCM, or as you might know him, Colour Sergeant Bourne, as he was during the Battle of Rourke's Drift. He was the senior British NCO present at the battle, but unlike many of his colleagues, he was never awarded the Victoria Cross. You probably remember him from the 1964 film Zulu. He was the huge chap with mutton chop sideburns and wrinkled from his many years of service across the empire. The centuries report Zulus to the southwest. Thousands of them. Yes, that's him, played by the excellent Nigel Green. But how realistic was that portrayal? And here's a question, what rank do you think he's fin he finished his career in? You might be surprised by the answer. OK, so Bourne's portrayal in the film Zulu was nearly as unrealistic as that of Private Henry Hook. But anyway, we'll get onto that in another episode. In the meantime, let's get back to the beginning. Frank Bourne was born in Sussex on the 27th of April 1854. Now let that date sink in for a moment. Anyway, moving on, and as the last of eight sons born to a farming family, it was clear that his options were pretty limited. He was a bright lad who could read and write, and he wanted a challenge. So, like many young men before and since, the army offered him a way out. And in December 1872, aged 18, he joined up in Brighton. His dad tried to stop him joining, but he couldn't. As well as being young, Bourne was also a small lad. He was only five foot five and he was skinny. He's listed as having a dark complexion, brown hair and grey eyes. In January 1873, he found himself posted to the 2nd Battalion of the 24th Regiment of Foot, which at that time was known as the 2nd Warwickshires, not the South Wales Borderers as they were to later become. Bourne was a natural soldier and he quickly began climbing up the ranks. He was promoted to corporal in 1875 and in 1878 became a colour sergeant, which is the senior sergeant in his company. Now, I'm struggling to find my source for this, but I've definitely read, or at least I think I'm right in saying, that he was the youngest man in the entire British Army to attain that rank and was quickly nicknamed the Kid by the men of B Company. At the time of the Battle of Rourke's Drift, he was just 24 years old. In 1878, the 2nd Battalion 24th were sent to South Africa and saw some limited action during the tail end of the Ninth Frontier War against elements of the Hausa speaking tribes. Shortly afterwards, the 24th were sent to Natal to take part in the invasion of Zululand. Now, this isn't the place to dive deeply into the causes of the war. I've made an hour long podcast about that, which I'll link to below in the description. But suffice it to say that B Company were left behind at the border to protect the stores. I'm sure a man like Bourne would have been bitterly disappointed at that, but he was able to keep busy by helping the men to write letters home and climbing Shiani Mountain, which was behind the mission station, every day to try and see the progress of the redcoats of the central column as it advanced towards Isandwana. But then, 142 years ago today, circumstances changed rapidly. The boom of artillery could be heard in the distance, and soon stragglers began passing Rourke's Drift as they escaped across the Buffalo River from the terrible slaughter of Isandwana, ten miles away. Born as the senior NCO was at the centre of everything that followed, organising the men, allocating their positions on the perimeter, and probably whispering a word or two of encouragement here or there too to some of the less experienced soldiers. Why is it I say? Nobody else. Bourne actually recorded his story for a BBC programme in December 1936, but shockingly it was later destroyed by someone at the BBC archive who thought that the interview was no longer of interest to anyone. Unbelievable. Luckily at least the transcript still exists, and suffice it to say Bourne was at the centre of the fight and did sterling work. At the end of his report he said, now, just one word for the men who fought that night. I was moving about amongst them all the time, and not for one moment did they flinch. The courage and their bravery cannot be expressed in words. For me, they were an example all my soldiering days. 
On the morning of the 23rd, the battered remains of Lord Chelmsford's central column limped back into Rourke's Drift. The fight for the mission station was now over, but bad weather and no cover from the elements soon left the garrison wet, exhausted and sick. It was a tough time for the men, though at least the survivors of B Company were given the honour of using the only tarpaulin available to the garrison. After the battle, Bourne was overlooked for the Victoria Cross. But he was awarded the next best thing, the DCM or Distinguished Conduct Medal, along with an annuity of £10 a year. He was also offered a commission. Now, I'm not sure what percentage of officers during the Victorian era had come up through the ranks, but I suspect the number is low, possibly lower than the Napoleonic era, although I am guessing. And it would have been a great privilege for him to be honoured in this way. But Bourne was from a farming family, and for financial reasons, he, he had to turn the commission down. Bourne and his company weren't involved in any more heavy fighting for the rest of the Anglo-Zulu War. And in 1880, they left South Africa for Gibraltar, where he married Eliza Mary and was promoted to a quartermaster sergeant. He was to have one more foreign posting, though, to India and Burma, where the 2nd 24th, now known as the South Wales Borderers, saw little action, actually, in that conflict in Burma. But it wasn't the end of Bourne's career. Unlike many of the heroes of Rourke's Drift, his career was, was to prove a stellar one. He was clearly excellent at his job and respected across the entire army. In 1890, he was finally promoted to honorary lieutenant and was appointed as the adjutant of the School of Musketry in Hythe, a post he filled for many years, eventually retiring as a major in 1907. But the story doesn't stop there, so don't click away, because it still wasn't the end for Frank. He went on to assist the legendary Lord Roberts with his society of miniature rifle clubs around London. And then, at the outbreak of World War I, he rejoined the army and was posted as adjutant to the School of Musketry in Dublin. Imagine being a young recruit and you turn up for your, for your musketry training and there is Frank Bourne, one of the heroes of Rourke's Drift. It must have been quite amazing for those guys. By the end of the Great War, Bourne had been promoted to the lofty heights of Lieutenant Colonel and was awarded an OBE in recognition of his services. I must say, this guy is an absolute stud, isn't he? In between everything else, he also managed to have five kids. Asked in later life about his service, Bourne simply said that he was lucky to have been at Rourke's Drift. He also hosted a family meal every year on the anniversary of the battle. Sadly though, as all of us do, he eventually died on the 8th of May 1945, literally as World War II was ending. He was 91 years old. So guys, for now at least, that's the last of my series on the Heroes of Rourke's Drift. But never fear, I will get back to it again in the next couple of months, once I've been able to spend some time working on some other videos, which are a priority right now. There are still so many amazing characters from Rourke's Drift that I want to cover, so I will, I will finish this series. <laughs> Message below if you're, if you're angry. Um, I think it's really important to keep these stories alive, so please do subscribe. Visit my website, redcoathistory.com, where I'll post the transcript to this video so you, can, so you can also read it. If you want to, you can register for my mailing list too, where I'll send you an email once a month with all the recent links and maybe any research I've been doing. But let's, you know, let's, let's try and build this together because I really want Redcoat History to be a place that our children can come to to learn about these battles where we can learn and I'm hoping you can help me to spread the word. All right, cheers guys.